I'm going to ask you to join me in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13. Uh, we have rejoined uh, this narrative in our sermon series, the narrative of how the gospel, the message about Jesus goes from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And in chapter 13, we are in the section of Acts where we see the gospel going to the ends of the earth, that through the ministry of Paul and Barnabas as the church in Antioch sends them out, uh, the good news about Jesus is going as we see, as we'll see at the end of the book, all the way to Rome. And because it went to Rome, it has come to us and it has become good news to us. And we are sent with this message, this good news to the world around us is what we're learning in this book. And so I'm gonna read a few sections from this chapter, but before I read, I wanna invite you to join me in singing this prayer as we approach the word of God. Open my eyes and I shall see Acts 13, verse 1, hear now the word of the Lord. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island, as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Barjesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Paul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy. Will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately, mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, and he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. And then join me in verse 44, and I'll read to the end of the chapter. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly saying, it was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life 
believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city, stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we ask that even now you would fill us with joy in the Holy Spirit as we come to your word, as we come to this story of the gospel going forward. May that message come into our hearts, into our homes this morning, and may it change us. And We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen. Well, my family, over the past few weeks, we have taken a lot of family walks just to get outside of the house. And I have noticed that on these walks, my kids have started playing a game. As we walk, they pretend to be blind. They close their eyes and pretend to be blind, which is a game that kids typically play. But it is interesting to me that they are playing that game at this particular time. Isn't that an appropriate game for the past few weeks? Hasn't the experience of this virus and the response to it at times felt like blindness? What information, which chart should we trust? Who do we listen to? How do we respond? What what will happen in the future and how do we plan? How do we take steps to plan for that? On our small group Zoom call last Sunday, we were laughing that we have all struggled with the question, what should I freak out about? (laughs) What should I be afraid of? Should, Should I freak out about the global shortage of toilet paper? This has been a confusing time, hasn't it? We have been reminded of how much we don't know and how much we don't control. What do we do with that sense of blindness? What do we do with that confusion? Well, this morning, I want us to come to Acts chapter 13 with our confusion. And we find here one of the many stories in the Bible about blindness. And so we're going to look at this chapter, and we will see the problem of blindness and the solution of true sight. So first of all, the problem. There is an irony in verse 11. And that irony is that this man, Bar-Jesus, who has lost his sight and needs other people to lead him by the hand, he is a person who should have superior sight and should lead other people. See, the role of magician, that word magician is loaded for us, but the role of magician in this ancient culture was the role of an expert, Kind of like the medical experts that have been so visible at press briefings. The magician was supposed to have special access to knowledge and power. And with that access, he was supposed to help people, and especially leaders, make decisions, make plans, and accomplish goals. We've seen something like this in our Old Testament community Bible reading. A king will want to go to war, and uh, he will reach out to a prophet before he goes to war. He will check in with these prophets who are supposed to have access to knowledge, to divine knowledge. And a false prophet will tell the king what he wants to hear. Yeah, go to war, you'll be successful, You'll, you'll gain glory. But a true prophet tells the king what God wants him to hear. The blindness of Bar-Jesus 
in Acts chapter 13 exposes that he is a false prophet. It, is, it exposes that he does not have the access that he claims to have. It, his blindness doesn't so much change his condition. It reveals a pre-existing condition. It reveals that he has been, he already is blind. He cannot see what he claims to see. He does not know what he claims to know. And he reveals this blindness even before verse 11. He reveals that he is a blind and false prophet in his opposition to the true word of God. In his opposition to the message about Jesus that is coming through Paul and Barnabas to the island of Cyprus. His resistance to the gospel reveals that he is unable to see, to perceive what God is doing. He is unable to know God, who he is, and what he wants. And so Paul says to him, you are not Bar-Jesus, which means son of the God who saves. No, you are a son of the devil. You are a son of the father of lies. You have been born from and into deception, confusion, blindness. And Bar Jesus belongs to a long line of blindness that comes before him and that comes after him. He represents the opposition that we see later in chapter 13, the Jewish opposition to the truth and good news of the, go of the gospel. And as hard as this is to hear, I know it's hard to hear, but we are, belong to that line of blindness. We were all born into that confusion. We have all been born into an inability to perceive, to know, to see what is most important. To know God and what he wants. And we are born into this confusion because we have been born under the power of sin. It is the power of sin that takes the straight paths of God and makes them crooked, makes us unable to see what God wants and walk towards it. We are all born blind to what is most important. The word apocalyptic has been used a lot recently, but that word does not mean catastrophe. It doesn't mean disaster. It doesn't mean the end of the world. The word apocalypse or apocalyptic uh, means to uncover, to unveil, to reveal. And in that sense, this time in which we find ourselves has the potential to be apocalyptic in a painful but good way. Because this event reveals to us that the confusion we feel, while, while it may be heightened, is not new. This confusion that we experience is the symptom of a deeper and a more ancient blindness. The brokenness that sin has brought into our minds and our hearts. So strange as it may seem, I want to invite you to embrace the apocalypse. To embrace what this experience 
can reveal to you about your true condition. I want to invite you to let this time uncover the depth of your need. To put you in that place of vulnerable powerlessness. Unable to see what you most need to see. And I want to invite you there because that's the first step. That is the first movement towards sight. But it is only the first movement. We can't stop there. We need to move beyond the problem of blindness to the solution of true sight. The story in Acts 13 leaves Bar-Jesus in darkness, which, if we share his blindness, leaves us with a pretty bleak future. But we need to notice another character in this story, the character who announces the judgment of blindness on Bar-Jesus, the Apostle Paul. Because the Apostle Paul had a similar experience to that of this magician, Do you remember from Acts chapter 9? Paul was an enemy to the true word of God. He was in opposition to the gospel, and he was on his way to Damascus in order to crush this new movement. But on the way to Damascus, he encountered the opposition. He encountered Jesus. And what was the result of that encounter? Blindness, like Bar-Jesus. Paul was blindness, but the story in Acts chapter 9 does not leave Paul in darkness. No, after three days, he goes to the house of a disciple of Jesus named Ananias, and Ananias lays his hands on Paul and prays for him, and Paul receives his sight, and he receives the Holy Spirit. But God didn't just heal Paul's blindness. He also gave him and sent him with the power of that healing to the ends of the earth. Which is why Acts 13 begins with an echo of Acts chapter 9. Just like Ananias, the church at Antioch lays their hands on Paul and Barnabas and prays for them, sending them into the world with the power of healing. It's why Paul in verse 47 of chapter 13 takes the words of the prophet Isaiah and claims them for himself and those who are working with him. He says, we have become light for the Gentiles, light for those in darkness. He is saying, God has sent us with the power to heal the deep, ancient human blindness. And what makes them light? What is this healing power? Well, it is the message that they carry. It is what they proclaim. It is the message that Jesus entered our darkness. He entered the dark power of sin. What happened as he died on the cross? Darkness. But Jesus was not owned. He was not kept by the power of sin. He overcame it and he rose to bring the healing light of God's grace to us. To bring to us forgiveness, the gift of his spirit, the hope of resurrection. And that is, is the light that will heal your blindness. As we receive and live in response to that message, 
we begin to truly see. Now that doesn't mean that Christians, that those who believe, to, believe in and belong to Jesus, that does not mean that we will magically know how to respond to the coronavirus. It doesn't mean that we will magically know what will happen in the future and how to plan for that future. Uh, it does not mean that we will avoid the negative impacts of this virus on our health, on our finances, on our employment. But here's what that does mean. It means in the midst of all that we don't know, there is solid ground. The solid ground of what we do know. The solid ground of a God who is for us. In Jesus. In the confusion, there is still clarity. And it is the clarity of His love for us that will hold us fast now and always. So, what do we do? with our confusion? Will we let the panic of what we don't know drive us to the peace of what we do know? We let the mists turn us to the light of the world who heals us and sends us with healing to those around us. I was reading recently about Gothic architects who were obsessed with light. They wanted to build these massive structures that would stay standing, but would also open. They would let in as much light as possible. we must become gothic architects with our lives. How this week can you structure your life in a way that lets in as much light as possible? How can you open your mind, your heart, to the light of who Jesus is for you. Maybe it's slowing down that endless frantic flow of information. Maybe it's taking a breath, becoming aware of the presence of God, the God who is for you and beginning to hear the whisper of his spirit who says in us, Abba, Father, who says to us, you are no longer a son or a daughter of confusion, of deception. No, you are a son, a daughter of God, the truth. You are a son, a daughter of light. On those family walks, when my kids pretend to be blind, they not only close their eyes, but they also reach out their hands and put them on my shoulder to let me lead them. Or they ask me to guide them with my voice. When you feel blind this week, know that through Jesus, you can reach out your hand and find the shoulder of a father. You can hear his voice saying to you, 
you are my beloved. And I will never leave you or forsake you. That is the light that will heal your blindness. Will you let the light in? Let's pray. Father, we ask that the clarity of your love would pierce our darkness. We ask that the light of Jesus and who he is and what he has done will come and clear away the mist in our minds and our hearts. This has been a confusing time and confusion scares us. And so would you bring the peace of what we know, of who you are and what you have done and calm our anxious hearts and help us to walk by faith, knowing that you are for us and that you will hold us fast. We pray it all in Jesus' name, amen.